So, hello friends. Uh, today I'll be talking on this uh, topic, uh, calcium channel blocker toxicity. So, at the outset, I wish to acknowledge uh, my colleague, Dr. Raghavendra Deshpande, who helped me develop this content. Uh, so, we had a very interesting case of uh, calcium channel blocker uh, overdose. Uh, so, this was a lady who came with consumption of 100 tablets of uh, calcium channel blocker, uh, amlodipine. Uh, so, um, just take you through the overview and there is one message that possibly gets conveyed at the end of this talk, uh, which really focuses on maximizing the optimal management when it comes to such overdoses. Uh, maybe perhaps this could possibly uh, prevent someone going on to needing other uh, extraordinary supports like ECMO because this patient, we had sort of kept ECMO as a standby. Uh, and then we'll just take you through this whole uh, narrative to how we should approach the treatment. So when you look at the calcium channel blocker overdose, predominantly they act on the conduction system. So they act on the SA node. So the uh, and causes depolarization and reduces the automaticity of the SA node. And uh, the calcium is needed for reducing the AB conduction and the calcium helps uh, within the myocardium to reduce the afterload and reduces the myocardial oxygen demand. And calcium also has an effect in causing coronary vasodilation and increases the myocardial oxygen supply. So overall, as you see, uh, the calcium within the myocardium has a multimodal effect in favoring the cardiac sort of a function by improving the conduction. And uh, it also helps in optimizing the coronary perfusion by increasing the vasodilation and increasing the myocardial oxygen supply. And at the peripheral level, it does uh, increase the vasodilation at the peripheral circulation as well, and it reduces the afterload. So these are some of the effects of uh, the calcium in general uh, at the vascular level and at the myocardium level. And uh, the intracellular calcium also determines the myocardial contractility by synchronizing the action of actin and myosin. So for effective functioning of actin and myosin, so optimal concentration of calcium within the myocardium is needed for effective myocardial contraction. That is something which one should bear in mind. And calcium, intracellular calcium levels is also needed to facilitate insulin release from the pancreas. So just bear this in mind as to the rationale as to why insulin is advocated in the management of calcium channel blocker because you need intracellular calcium levels, optimal levels to facilitate release of insulin from the pancreas. So these are some of the functions of optimal concentration of calcium within the cells. And all this gets affected when calcium channel blockers uh, toxicity happens. So when we talk about dihydropyridines, which is typically amlodipine, clinidipine, so the predominant effect of these is by causing severe vasodilation. So this dihydropyridine, the major catastrophic effects happens due to profound vasodilation and hypotension that ensues. Uh, so other calcium channel blockers like verapamil and diltazem predominantly act on the conduction system and leads to conduction disturbance. So if, if, so if a patient comes with an overdose of verapamil or diltazem, the predominant effect would be the conduction blocks, bradycardia, acystole, and so on and so forth. So conduction disturbance will be predominant. But if someone has come with an overdose of dihydropyridine, predominant vasodilation and hypotension so the patient we had had come with 100 tablets of taking amlodipine. So they predominantly have hypotension and conduction disturbance may not be that profound. And uh, with verapamil and diltazem, obviously bradycardia and conduction blocks and escape rhythms is something that one can see. So a lot of conduction abnormalities with bundle branch blocks and uh, conduction disturbance is something that one can witness. <clears throat> So when calcium channel blockers interferes with mitochondrial function leading to ATP hydrolysis and leads to increase in the lactate production at the mitochondrial levels. And when there is a calcium channel blocker toxicity, uh, it causes reduction in the insulin release, which as I said, intracellular optimization of calcium is needed for optimal insulin release. So when there is a calcium channel blocker toxicity, this reduction of the insulin release from the pancreas and it, it leads to insulin resistance and hyperglycemia is something that one can witness when there is a CCB overdose or toxicity. So these are some, so basically you would have conduction disturbance if it is dihydropyridines, it causes profound hypotension 
at the mitochondrial level also it interferes with the mitochondrial function so they can have lactic acidosis there is increased production of lactic acid and there is reduced production of insulin insulin resistance and hyperglycemia so these are some of the vicious conundrum that you would see in someone with calcium channel blocker toxicity so the clinical feature the onset of uh, clinical symptoms starts at 2 to 3 hours and can last up to 6 hours so when there is a sustained release medications that taken that gets taken uh, so the clinical features can manifest up to 16 hours so the typical clinical features is due to the hypotension that sets in so they can have dizziness and lightheadedness and they can have altered mental status uh, secondary to hypoperfusion and low cardiac output state because of profound vasodilation and hypotension that happens so hypotension is a uh, expected sort of a clinical features quite intuitive and if there is uh, uh, conduction disturbance, uh, they, they can have bradycardia and cardiogenic shock is something that can manifest. Mm -hmm. And as I said, uh, calcium channel blockers inhibits the release of insulin from the pancreas because there is reduction in the insulin, hyperglycemia and metabolic acidosis, lactic acidosis due to ATP hydrolysis due to mitochondrial dysfunction can happen. And hypokalemia and hypocalcemia are some of the uh, clinical features that one could expect and uh, in ECG there could be varying conduction abnormalities from bradycardia to different types of blocks and to complete heart blocks on and so forth so you can see any of these disturbances as uh, clinical features so when it comes to treatment uh, so the teenets of any toxicity would be airway breathing circulation if someone is very obtended obviously we need to take care of airway and ensure that someone is breathing adequately if they're not breathing then you have to assist them with their breathing with bag and mask ventilation and assess the circulation. And someone comes with calcium channel blocker overdose, they need to be connected. They have to be indefinitely in ICU because they need to be connected to cardiac monitor. You need to monitor heart rate, saturation, and blood pressure and so on and so forth. And history is very important. It is good to ascertain the history, whether they have taken uh, immediate sort of an acting calcium channel blockers or sustained release, and whether it, this has been co-ingested with other medications. And the lag time before which patient has presented to you, uh, because that determines as to how much absorption has happened. So the his so historical sort of inputs with the, pertaining to these uh, elements has to be taken into consideration. And cardiologist's opinion may have to be taken because some of these patients with conduction disturbance may need uh, transvenous spacing or balloon pump. So input from cardiologists uh, is valuable. And atropine as a drug to treat any bradycardia or conduction blocks is generally ineffective. So they are not something that is routinely recommended in these patients. So may not be very effective in calcium channel blocker overdose. And whole bowel irrigation uh, is something that has found to be useful in calcium channel blockers and that is something that needs to be considered. And alkalinization of the urine and hemodialysis, it is not dialysable. Hemodialysis, hemoperfusion are of no benefit with calcium channel blocker. And um, volume optimization, uh, confining to the rules of dynamic indices and fluid responsiveness is the way to go. So you wouldn't keep pushing in fluids just because they're hypotensive, because there is profound vasodilation. You can assess uh, volume responsiveness based on the, on the tools, on the dynamic indices that uh, most intensivists are aware. And the optimization of volume status is something that could be done. Activated charcoal is recommended in patients with calcium channel blocker overdose. So the dosage is one gram per kg in one to two hours to be given uh, over four to four hours. And uh, this has shown to reduce absorption by 49%. So whole bubble irrigation and activated charcoal is something to be considered. And this could be repeated when there is a severe uh, sort of an overdose. It could be repeated at 0.5 grams per kg every two to four hours uh, based on the uh, on the severity of the CCB overdose. So whole bubble irrigation and activated charcoal at this dose is something that could be considered as soon as they present to ER and preferably within one to two hours, the efficacy would be maximal. And uh, this, this could be repeated based on the bubble function uh, because if someone is in ileus or bubble distension, obviously this is something which you would avoid. So, so this is some of the immediate resuscitative measures that one could put in place. So how about the role of calcium? So as you see pictorially, as you can see, calcium channel blocker blocks the calcium channels, L-type calcium channels, and there is prevention of entry of calcium through the channels. 
So the rationale for giving uh, intravenous calcium is some of the channels that are open. So if there is increase in the extracellular presence of the calcium, this could be utilized in certain L-type channels that may be opened. And this uh, function could be optimized is the rationale. So calcium chloride is something that could be considered and it is shown to improve hypotension and conduction abnormalities. Calcium chloride is preferred over calcium gluconate. So the dose is 10 to 20 ml every 10 to 20 minutes, three to four doses, it could be repeated. And this, since it is a short acting, infusion could be considered at 0.2 to 0.4 ml per kg per hour. Uh, so is uh, something that one could consider in calcium channel because it, the whole intent is to increase the extracellular calcium because any of the channels which are not blocked, uh, uh, the optimization of the calcium entry could be facilitated by increasing the calcium levels. But the key thing is to make sure that calcium levels are monitored very closely, uh, two to four hourly. The reason is hypercalcemia symptoms can sometimes uh, complicate the things. And the and patient can manifest with symptoms of hypercalcemia, which can also be devastating or uh, disastrous. So the risk of hypercalcemia. So if you call, if if you do not monitor calcium levels and hypercalcemia is caused, it can lead to hepatic necrosis. It can lead to splenic infarct. It can lead to acute tubular necrosis. So that is something which needs to be avoided. So calcium has to be monitored very closely and at least maintained in a reasonable levels and not to allow manifestations of hyperclancemia to set in. So, so this is something I want to focus. So the key determining factor for uh, treating uh, calcium channel blocker is insulin. So the whole concept is to because it inhibits calcium channel blockers, inhibit the release of uh, insulin from the pancreas. So they'll be deficient in insulin and hyperglycemia will set in. So the whole concept is to maximize or optimize management with hyperinsulinemic euglycemia. So this is the term that needs to be used. So we have to give supranormal levels of insulin and maintain euglycemia to reverse the whole effects of uh, calcium channel blockers. And uh, and as I said, calcium channel blockers inhibits the release of insulin, leading to insulin resistance and hyperglycemia. And calcium channel blocker shifts the myocardial dependence from the free fatty acid substrate to carbohydrate, which is also one of the detrimental causes. So basically, the myocardium depends on the free fatty acid as a fuel for contractility. So with calcium channel blocker, this shifts to the carbohydrate as a substrate for myocardial function, which can be disastrous. So the dose of insulin is one unit per kg you have to give and it, it, it can be increased up to 10 units per kg per hour. So which means if someone is uh, 60 kgs, you, so the suggestion or the recommendation is the insulin dose has to be increased up to 600 units per hour. So up to five units per kg per hour appears appropriate, which means up to 300 units. For our patient, we gave up to 300 units per hour. So this is what I want to focus because if you do not optimize your insulin replacement or insulin increase up to 10 units per kg, and then very often you would justify yourself putting these patients on ECMO. And this is what uh, really happened in our patient also, because we almost had all the gear ready for ECMO. But what we really wanted to see is try to maximize and optimize your insulin delivery because this is the game changer because we do not optimize your insulin increase up to 10 units per kg but in our patient we went up to 300 units per hour which is five units per kg per hour and then things dramatically reverse so the message for all the listeners in intensive care is maximize your therapy with activated charcoal whole bowel irrigation and give insulin. And insulin is the game changer in any of these overdose. We need to maximize up to 5 to 10 units per kg. Only then, if things are not reversing, then you think of ECMO. Because this is the classic situation where you can prevent patients from going on unnecessary ECMO by optimizing your levels of insulin delivery. So that is the key message in this whole thing. And the goal is, once we keep increasing insulin up to 5 units per kg per hour, Goal is to achieve hemodynamic stability and you should start seeing weaning of the vasopressors and insulin has shown to have positive inotropic. So the game changer is insulin. Please remember hyperinsulinemic euglycemia is the way to treat these patients 
we need to maximize insulin up to 300 units and do not consider ECMO until you have optimized your insulin delivery even up to 600 units because in our patient, we gave up to 300 units and it's absolutely safe. Nothing is going to happen. You can give it with dextrose infusion because generally these patients will have hyperglycemia and they will tolerate these high levels. This is the message that I wanted to give in this talk. And if blood sugar level is less than 200, use any concentration of dextrose, be it 5%, 10%, or 25% with serum potassium. And I'm sure any intensivists listening to this are experts in managing DKS. So you can, if it's less than 200, give dextrose solutions and it will not cause hypoglycemia. Our patient, we gave 300 units per hour, never did she have hypoglycemia. So the reason I'm highlighting is, so this was the case series published in 2018 in Indian Journal of Critical Care Medicine. Excellent case series where they have said ECMO was used as a salvage measure to save this patient. If you see the type of drugs they're given, fantastic. They've given all calcium gluconate, they've given glucagon, lipid, sodium bicarbonate. But if you look at the insulin here, They've given, these are the three patients, they've given 60 units per hour, 40 units per hour, 40. This is very, very less because all the recommendations suggest that you need to give, this is a bolus, 60 units, they have given bolus, that is fantastic. But you need to increase it to 5 units per kg or 10 units, so if it is a 60 kg, 5 units per kg is, it comes to 300 units, so you have to optimize. So. I would be a little skeptical. So here in this case series, they have not optimized insulin because insulin is the game changer. I would have expected if these patients were given up to 300 units or 400 units and then still patients did not improve, yes, you put them on ECMO. So I, I think this is the message that I would wish to deliver here that optimize, maximize your therapeutic modalities and then resort to other modalities which may be life-saving and not jump into ECMO because it's very easy. Now, my patient, she was on three vasopressors. She was an adrenaline, noradrenaline, vasopressor, but it's okay because insulin did make a magical difference. Vasopressors, we could wean it very effectively. See, this is the point I wanted to make. And how about glucagon? Yes, glucagon causes activation of adenolite cyclase through G protein and it has a positive chronotropy and positive inotropy. And animal studies by Bailey et al. has shown it improves the heart rate, improves cardiac output, and reversal of the AV block. So the glucagon dose is 5 to 10 milligram, 1 to 2 minutes, and effect lasts up to 10 to 15 minutes. And the suggestion is we have to give it as an infusion at 2 to 10 mg per hour. So in our patient, we gave calcium, we gave insulin. I think the game changer was maximizing the insulin dose, and we gave glucagon at this dose. And the side effects of glucagon is it can cause vomiting, hyperglycemia, and hypokalemia is something that can cause. Lipid emulsion, so intralipid C is suggested. So basically, the way lipid emulsion acts is it creates the lipid core within the plasma and the presence of the lipid within the plasma. So this is just a pictorial representation. If this is a plasma and you have a lipid sort of a space that is created or the lipid pool that is created, it sort of attracts the lipophilic sort of a molecule. So Parapamil and diltiazem, which are protein bound or lipid bound, they are, they are uh, taken up by this and uh, the levels can be reduced. And another important thing is, as I said, the calcium channel blocker changes the utilization of the myocardium from free fatty acid by increasing the free fatty acid pool by giving lipid. Uh, so there is a reversal of this component happening. And there is a uh, the dependence of uh, myocardium on carbohydrate is reversed to free fatty acid. So this is something that could be achieved by increasing the lipid pool. So the dosage is 1.5 ml per kg, 20% to be given as bolus and then given as infusion at 0.25 to 0.5 ml per kg per hour over 30 minutes. Even this we gave for our patient. The key thing is to monitor triglyceride level and not allow it to go to supranormal level because hypertriglyceridemia can cause pancreatitis and other uh, vicious conundrum or the deleterious effects. So intralipid is also something that one could uh, one should one could consider to use. And the efficacy of this lipid emulsion uh, as a lifesaver is shown to be mainly from the animal reports and case reports. Uh, so there's no big data that is available. Methylene blue inhibits like. Um, glenolate cyclase and reduces the CGMP and the CG, reduction of the CGMP inhibits the production of nitric oxide synthase because nitric oxide synthase produces nitric oxide which is a potent vasodilator. So methylene blue can be considered as an adjunct to the other therapeutic modalities. So the catecholamines, norepinephrine is the first choice and uh, very often we may have to add a second drug which can be epinephrine or vasopressin. So our patient was on norepinephrine, epinephrine and vasopressin 
and milrinone and levosimendon uh, is something that is sort of could be considered as an abject because levosimendon is a calcium channel sensitizer uh, but we we didn't have to use any of this uh, so our patient was on norepinephrine epinephrine and vasopressin and this was rapidly been once we started going up on insulin up to 300 units per hour so and methylene blue is only an adjunct to other measures so if all this fail so you have maximized the insulin you have glucagon as a bolus glucagon as an infusion calcium as a bolus calcium as an infusion lipid all this and you have maximized insulin up to maybe 500 units per hour 600 units per hour still your inotropes are not coming then definitely you have to think of other non pharmacologic support like pacing uh, balloon pump and ecmo is definitely the way to go if you have maximized on all these therapies so the only point i'm trying to make here is the case series that was published as we see that possibly perhaps we could have gone up more on insulin so here in our patient at 40 units she was on three vasopressors and once we started increasing we saw a dramatic sort of a uh, shift with lactates coming down and with insulin levels coming down we had all the ecmo gear set up next to the patient but uh, we were delighted to see once we went up to 300 units hour per hour things uh, dramatically started changing vasopressors started coming down so that is the only message that i wish to deliver through this talk so the summary of this talk is the management predominantly depends on having a protocolized approach calcium chloride give a 10 to 10 20 ml uh, every 10 to 20 minutes up to 3 to 4 doses followed by initiate the patient on norepinephrine and epinephrine and maybe you have to add vasopressin which needs to be titrated to the response and following you optimize the volume status based on the principles of fluid responsiveness following which give glucagon 5 to 10 mg or 1 to 2 minutes and give it as infusion at 2 to 10 mg per hour but the game changer if so wish to reemphasize is the insulin one unit per kg you give bolus 60 you 60 kg is person you give 60 units but following by infusion at not one unit per kg which is 60 units per hour as the case series showed increase up to 5 units per kg or even 10 units so here our patient was around 60 kg is 5 6 30 300 units per hour we gave and things change and fat emulsion you can give at 1.5 ml per kg at 20% followed by 0.25 to 0.5 ml per kg per minute or 30 minutes and all this fail you could think of uh, mechanical support like pacing and mainly ecmo remains the gold standard at this point of time so thank you one and all so i went with this beautiful quote i like people that i can trust with my eyes closed and my back turned so you wish to rehear to this lecture you can visit my www.com so thank you one and all